All right, thanks everyone for bearing with us. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for sticking around for my talk. So I'm Sarah, and uh, I'm going to talk about some work done with my former PhD students, George and Haroon, and some of our collaborators, Reiner, Sophia, and Bernard. And the topic of this work is really about de-anonymizing Bitcoin. So, uh, it's pretty echoey, sorry. Um, so yeah, hopefully none of you need to be told uh, that Bitcoin is not anonymous. Um, so you know, there's been extensive academic work on this point, um, on it at this point. Uh, a lot of these papers came out though really eight to 10 years ago. So you might say, oh, this is kind of, who cares? But to be honest, in the past eight to 10 years, this has become far from a, a kind of academic research problem. There are now many companies that do this kind of Bitcoin uh, de-anonymization work for a living. They work with governments, banks, and law enforcement agencies. Um, and we can see here some of the really kind of high profile takedowns that have happened as a result of uh, this work. So, Again, this is really like a global industry at this point, and at its heart um, are really a series of uh, what we call kind of clustering heuristics. So the idea is that in Bitcoin, um, an entity representing an individual user or a bigger service like an exchange can use many different addresses uh, or pseudonyms, and these clustering heuristics allow us to kind of collapse all that usage back to the same entity that initiated it so that we can talk about sort of their, their behavior as, again, an individual rather than all of their individual addresses. So one of the kind of biggest heuristics um, that we use, or the one really that's the most established, um, is often called the multi-input or the co-spend heuristic. And this heuristic essentially says that in any Bitcoin transaction with multiple inputs, um, all of the inputs belong to the same entity. So the same entity controls all of those addresses. So I'm not going to say in this talk, you know, why that's a, a good heuristic or why we use it, uh, but suffice it to say that there is one type of behavior called a coin join or a, another type of mixing transaction that would invalidate this heuristic. But in general, this heuristic is very much believed to be safe and is very much used in practice today. So this heuristic is really effective. You know, it, it applies be far beyond a single transaction. Uh, but it ignores a really important type of, um, a really prevalent type of behavior in Bitcoin, um, which is the idea of making change. So making change in Bitcoin is a lot like making change in cash. Um, and this is because Bitcoin operates in what's called a, a UTXO based model. And so we can see here, you know, basically any time you don't have the exact amount that you want to pay someone stored in one of your UTXOs or your addresses, you're going to need to make change again, just like you would with cash. So here we can see Alice has 15 coins stored with one of her addresses, and Bob is asking for 14 coins. So what Alice does is she forms a transaction with two outputs. Uh, one of them is Bob, and he gets his 14 coins just like he asked. And then the other one is Alice's change that she needs to make out of her 15 coin input. And so for that, she creates another output, um, which is called the change address, and she sends the change, the one coin, to that. So the idea is that you know, one of these outputs, money is actually changing hands, it's going to Bob, but the other one, it's not, and it's actually just staying with the same user. So the change heuristic basically says that as long as we can identify the change address in a transaction, we can assign that to the same entity as the input, um, as the input one, right? And if these live in larger clusters, then we collapse those larger clusters down as well. So we can see that this is sort of strictly more, you know, we can strictly build on top of the multi-input cluster using this change heuristic. It's also quite powerful on its own though, um, in following a certain type of pattern in the Bitcoin network that's called a peel chain. So the idea here is imagine we have uh, one of these transactions with one input and two outputs, and it's this sort of blue entity that's initiated the transaction. Well, if we can identify the change address, then we can also isolate the kind of meaningful recipient in this transaction. And we can say, oh, the blue entity was interacting with that red entity. And why stop here? We, we're still with the blue entity. We've still identified one of their addresses. So we may as well just continue following where that money goes, right? And so now we go to the next transaction where that change address spends its coins. And now we've identified a new sort of counterparty for this blue entity. So these peel chains typically in Bitcoin last hundreds or thousands of hops. Basically every transaction we can really think of as living within one of these kinds of peel chains. And the kind of hypothesis um, is that identifying recipients of these peels, identifying this series of meaningful uh, recipients 
has a significant impact on the anonymity of not just uh, one of the entities, but the other one, right? So if I can identify one of your counterparties, that has a significant effect on your anonymity as well. So hopefully I've convinced you that this change heuristic is extremely powerful, um, and this really, again, forms the foundation of not just clustering, but also tracking in uh, the Bitcoin network. But of course, I haven't actually told you how we identify the change address at all. So that's really kind of uh, the, what we've done in this research. We're going to propose a really different change heuristic from the ones that were out there before. Um, those ones sort of relied on the freshness or the one-time use of the change address. Um, and what we're going to do instead is we're going to really exploit the evolution that has happened in Bitcoin. So, you know, those of you who are familiar with cryptocurrencies might think, you know, Bitcoin has no evolution. It's very, you know, difficult to move it forward compared to other cryptocurrencies. But it has actually changed uh, quite a lot, um, you know, since these, these earlier pieces of research were published uh, and certainly since it was deployed. So we're going to sort of characterize uh, multi-input clusters in three different ways. We're first going to consider the features of the transactions that this cluster forms. So in this paper, we pick four different features. Um, I should mention there was a work earlier this year by um, Moser and Narayanan that picks more features. Um, so there's, there's more that are out there. Um, there's also many different address types in Bitcoin. So the encoding of the, the public key or the script that you're using um, as your address. And then finally, there's this kind of like almost ridiculously simple uh, change strategy, which essentially says that in the uh, transactions inside of this cluster, at what index is the change address in the list of outputs, okay? And so we can basically say it's, uh, the change strategy is zero if the change address is always first in the list. It's minus one if the change strategy is always last. Uh, it's one if it's one of the two. And then it's none if there's no discernible pattern, you know, if it just appears at sort of ran random looking indices um, in that output list. All right, so here's kind of our heuristic in a nutshell. So what we do is we first form these multi-input clusters. Okay, so we sort of collapse all these addresses and transactions down and we say these all belong to the same entity. And now what we're gonna do is we're kind of gonna use these features to characterize the sort of expected behavior of this cluster, of this entity. So again, this is really just we go through all the transactions in this cluster and we sort of add them to a set of features. All right, we do the same thing with the address types. So we go through the addresses in the cluster and we say, um, you know, what are the different types that are available? And then finally, we can assign a single change strategy to the entire cluster, again, according to, um, to its transactions. So now we've sort of defined the expected behavior of the cluster. And when we see um, you know, an address from this cluster initiate a new transaction, what we're essentially gonna do is we're going to look at the outputs in that uh, transaction, and we're gonna say which of these outputs matches the expected behavior of the cluster. So for example, with the change strategy, um, you know, that might already eliminate a lot of the addresses in the outputs, right? If the change strategy is zero, then we now consider as a candidate change address only the first address in the list, and we completely ignore all of the other ones. On the other hand, if the change strategy is none, we have to consider all of them still. But what we do essentially is, a, you know, we, we come up with this list of candidate change addresses based on this change strategy, and then we label as change the unique output address that matches the features that we're looking for, for the, from that cluster in terms of the address type of, um, the type of the address, and then the features of the transaction in which it then spends its contents. So the kind of next hop in the peel chain. And we only label um, something as change if there's a single output address that matches this, this pattern, right? Otherwise, we don't know which it is. So just consider for a second, um, you know, if hopefully you've been following, that the only way we can encounter, the only way we can uh, have a false positive here is if in this one transaction, the cluster suddenly completely changes its behavior. It does something we've never seen it do before. And in the meantime, the counterparty in the transaction completely emulates what we expect from the cluster. Right, that's the only way we could accidentally label the wrong thing as the change address. So that's kind of the, you know, the, the theory behind why this is a, a safe, um, good heuristic. 
Uh, luckily, in this work, we, a, we had the chance to actually validate this heuristic. Um, so we worked directly with Chainalysis, one of these blockchain analytic companies, um, and ended up, um, from data that they gave us, you know, I'll leave the details in the paper, um, we ended up being able to form 60 uh, true positive multi-input clusters and 60 false positive multi-input clusters. Okay, so we had 120 clusters in total. Um, and uh, by the way, I should say, uh, again, details are in the paper, but a lot of these clusters, even the false positive ones, were incredibly consistent in their behavior. The majority of them had a transaction uh, set size of one, meaning there was one set of features that they ever used. Um, and they were also relatively distinct in their behavior. There wasn't a ton of overlap in these sets. Okay, so what we did is we sought to validate this cluster by sort of following peel chains out of every transaction um, inside of the cluster. And we considered sort of two factors in terms of evaluating these clusters. We considered how effective are they in expanding the cluster um, in terms of the ratio of new to old transactions. And then how safe are they in terms of uh, what is the false discovery rate? So notably, we couldn't um, identify true positives. The best we could do was sort of unknown positives. Um, but we could identify false positives, again, drawing on data provided by chain analysis, essentially if, the, if we encountered in following these peel chains a tag for an address that was in conflict with the tag uh, available for the cluster, then we could say this is a false positive, right? So we're essentially taking chain analysis's tags as, as ground truth. Okay, so um, that sort of gives us the uh, false discovery rate. So in addition to evaluating our own heuristic that I've just presented, um, we of course wanted to also evaluate um, the existing heuristics present in the literature. Um, so there's um, sort of the original ones from 2013, and then there's several uh, sort of refined versions um, from more recently. Um, and basically we can see that for uh, a lot of these old heuristics, the false discovery rate is incredibly high. Right, so you know, this one-time use behavior, while it may have been an indication um, of a, a change address you know, in Bitcoin as it existed eight to 10 years ago, this seems to be really problematic today, and it seems you know, very possible to create false positives um, with this heuristic. So the exception is uh, this last one, due to Ermilov et al. But there we can kind of see that at a, you know, they have a lower false discovery rate, but it also has really um, hampered their effectiveness. So the, fall, the expansion factor is, is significantly lower. Um, our heuristic, on the other hand, uh, did much better, if I'm being honest, than we expected it to do. So not only is it incredibly safe, achieving a false discovery rate of 0.02, um, it's also the most effective one in terms of actually expanding the clusters. So it's the most effective and uh, by several orders of magnitude, uh, the most safe. So that's really it. I hope I've at least uh, piqued your interest in uh, taking a look at the paper. Uh, it does contain more results than I've presented. Um, and of course I should mention, you know, what I've presented is, is of course limited. We had 120 clusters, it's not, you know, that many. Um, but it does seem to be rel relatively effective, at least based on this initial data. Um, I'll mention there's another result in the paper that you know, I really like, which is that we can also use this um, heuristic to actually validate the results of the multi-input heuristic. So kind of treat it as an orthogonal way of clustering things together and then seeing if they agree on the results or not. Um, and of course I should mention, you know, if, if this concerns you, um, it is possible to evade this heuristic um, by just randomizing the, f I mean just, by randomizing the features of your transactions. Um, that would make it essentially impossible to continue following these peel chains. So yeah, if there's one takeaway from this talk, I hope it's uh, that Bitcoin is not anonymous, tell your friends. And um, yeah, I'd like to say a, a really big thank you to Chainalysis for working with us on this, um, getting us this data. Thank you to IC3 for funding it. Thanks to you for listening, and uh, yeah, happy to take any questions.